Um, so this is uh, a uh, modified version of a talk I gave at CPPCon. Um, we can take a little bit more time uh, on a couple of areas. Um, we will take uh, questions a couple of times on the way through, but there is so much to talk about. There's, we'll be able to, uh, as he said, be able to chat afterwards. So uh, it's a bug hunt. Um, this is about armor plating your unit tests. Um, and unit testing is a big, big topic. Um, this is probably not even remotely a complete list of all the different aspects. Um, this talk in particular is about this bottom one. What we're talking about today is specifically how to make your tests, your unit tests, good tests, how to make them good at testing your code. Um, this is kind of the fundamental aspect of unit testing. There's a lot of other nice things that unit tests bring when you go do them. You improve your interfaces, you get documentation, all these other wonderful things. Test-driven development is a wonderful way to develop code. But if your tests aren't good at actually finding bugs in your code, you're not going to be happy with them. So this talk is all about how to make your tests good at testing your code because it's a bug hunt. Now, the question is, how many of you recognize that quote? And uh, I can't see all of you. Um, when I give this talk live out here, typically a few people of my generation do. Um, I started at SciTech, my current company, uh, about four years ago, a little over four years. Promptly got put in charge of a development team. I'd never been in charge of a development team before. We had about half a million lines of legacy code dumped on us. Uh, real legacy in the sense that we inherited it from somebody else. So it wasn't long before a real problem showed up and I went to the team and I said, all right, everybody, it's a bug hunt. And I got absolute silence. No responses at all. They're just giving me puzzled looks like maybe a lot of you are right now. And this was seriously the first time that I felt professionally old because I realized that the movie I was referencing was older than most of the people on my team. So just to make sure that we all know exactly what I'm talking about. Morning, Marines. Sorry we didn't have time to greet you people before we left Gateway. But what is this? What's the question? It's going to be a stand-up fight, sir, or maybe a flag fight. All we know is that there's still no contact with the colony. Xenomorph may be involved. A what? A xenomorph. Exactly. Yeah, it's a bug hunt. This is, of course, James Cameron's masterpiece from 1986, Aliens. Maybe not the high point of Western civilization, and I don't know how big a deal it was uh, on the rest of the planet, but... Uh, over here in the United States, this is a very big deal for at least a certain generation of people who were growing up at the time. Um, now, before we go on, um, this talk was originally prepared for CPPCon, which has a, court, a code, code of conduct. You probably have a code of conduct. Um, action and war and horror movies might not be your thing. So let me just assure you that although we are going to see some clips from aliens, um, they've been very carefully edited. There's no violence. There's no gunfire, and there's almost no aliens. So everyone ought to be able to enjoy this. Um, the reason we're going to watch clips from aliens is that it is a surprisingly good source of examples and lessons about good and bad ways to go deal with bugs. Uh, if for no other reason, then we really want your bug hunts to go better than theirs. Because, uh, spoiler alert, um, the movie's 36 or 37 years old now, so we can do spoilers. Their bug hunt does not go well. Their bug hunt does not go well at all. Um, you will note as we go through these clips that every time the number of people is going down. Um, we want your bug hunts to go better than that. We really do. So to get started, uh, I say this at every talk, and I'm going to keep saying this, that modern science and modern software testing have basically converged. They're the same thing. Back in the 30s and 40s, after modern physics showed up, quantum mechanics, special and general relativity, uh, we had to go back and kind of rework the philosophical foundations of science. And so Karl Popper 
uh, his falsifiability criteria is basically what science is built on now, in which uh, we admit that we cannot generally prove scientific theories through. Uh, we can do it in a few cases, but generally we can't. All we can do is prove them false. So when Dijkstra comes along in 70, and uh, in 1970, and says that program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never their absence, this is exactly the same statement. This is Popper's falsifiability criterion applied to software testing. We can't prove them correct, except in maybe some very special cases. Um, what we can do is attempt to prove them incorrect and then fail to do so. And our confidence that our code is correct directly tracks how hard we've tried to show that it isn't. And so this is modern science, but this is also modern testing. And remember that your code on a CPU doing whatever it does is a physical system. You've got a physical system there displaying very complicated quantum mechanical properties, right? All CPUs are quantum mechanical things fundamentally. And we arrange them in a very, very complicated state by putting your programs on it, which does some complicated bit with electrons and voltages and whatever it does. And then it does something like play Fortnite. But that has observable properties like does it run the game properly. And those are what we want to go find. So when we write tests, any tests, mod, unit tests or otherwise, we are really building laboratory apparatus to investigate a physical system for certain properties. That's really what we're about. So what we're going to do is take a page from experimental science and look at what experimental physicists need out of their lab experiments. And of course, you can write whole books on that. But for our purposes, it really comes down to, is it repeatable? Being able to do it again and get the same answer is a fundamental uh, requirement for doing any science. Is it accurate and is it precise? And so these are the armor plating that you need on your unit tests. Now, repeatable means that you get the same answer every time you run it. And replicable means that your colleagues get the same thing that you do when they run it. I'm not going to talk about those because the previous year in 2021, I spent about half of my talk discussing this. And it's a long story, but you can go see that. The talk is called The Unit Test Strike Back. And it doesn't have any video clips, but there are some good science fiction references. What we're going to talk about today really comes down to accuracy and precision. Now, in colloquial English, these are pretty much interchangeable. People will use either. Uh, in place of the other, and there's really no difference between them. But of course, in science, there's a very clear difference between them. Accuracy means something about how far your results are away from the right value. Well, some specific value, which you would like to be the right answer, whatever right means. Whereas precision means something about the probability distribution of your measurements or the, the random errors in your measurements and so forth. Um, we don't actually need the mathematical definition, and it isn't actually very useful to us. This is a better intuitive picture. So on the, uh, on the left, we have an example. Say we're trying to measure where the bullseye is. So on the left, we have high accuracy and low precision. We have a wide spread of results. And so in some sense, each result doesn't tell us much because you have to take a lot of measurements for your statistics to converge on something and give you a decent... Uh, uh, a decent confidence interval. Um, but you are going to get the right answer, so it's accurate. On the other side, though, we see low accuracy and high precision, where we have a very tight clustering of results. Each result has a lot of information in it. You don't need to do this many times before you've got good statistics, but the answer is wrong. So we have uh, high accuracy, low precision in one case, low accuracy, and high precision in the other. So kind of roughly speaking, we can say that accuracy is something about your equipment being correct, while precision is about it being reliable. Now, this is all well and good, but unit tests really don't match that very well. You can define accuracy for unit tests. Unit tests are something called a uh, binary classifier. So it's either true or false. You, you only get uh, two possible results out. Um, but there is mathematical justification for this in which uh, we can say that a positive result, remember that we can't use tests to prove that our code is correct. So that's not what we try to do. 
our code is to find bugs. Our code is to find things that aren't right. And so when our code detects a bug, that's a positive result for our lab equipment. That's a positive result. We just found what it is we're looking for. So a positive result means that your test fails because there's a bug. And a negative result means that your tests pass. Note, this is not the emotional response you have, right? I'm not claiming you're always going to be happy when you get a positive result because it means that you have to do more work and you can't go home yet. This is positive in the sense of your COVID tests, right? If you get a positive on your COVID test, it means you need to stay home and you might start getting sick. Um, the definition here, we don't actually care about the math very much. I'm a physicist, so I have to put a little math in every uh, one of my talks or they take away my card, right? But uh, their definitions are useful. Um, a true positive means that your test fails and there is a bug. A true negative means that the test passes because there are no bugs. A false positive is when your test fails, but there's no bug there. So this is a false alarm and presumably wastes time and effort and so forth because you have to go chase down what's going on. Whereas a false negative means that your test passes in the presence of bugs and those have now slipped through and may end up in production. Now it turns out that, well, uh, people have been saying this before. So if you go back, there's a great talk from 2015 CPPCon by Titus Winters and Hiram Wright called All Your Tests Are Terrible. Um, if you want an introduction to unit testing, that's absolutely where I would start. Go watch that. And Titus says this. A lot of other people say the same thing. Tests should fail because the code under test fails and for no other reason. What they're really saying is that we need accurate tests. We need true positive. We, we need our positives to be true and our negatives to be true, and we don't want false positives and false negatives. Now, for precision, it turns out precision isn't mathematically defined for binary classifiers. But we can generalize what we were saying before about a highly precise measurement giving you a lot of information, or a precise laboratory setup giving you uh, more information per measurement than otherwise. And we will generalize that to say that a precise unit test gives you a lot of information about what just went wrong. And we'll tighten that up a little bit later with an example. Now, this is all well and good. This is all very abstract and mathematical. And if you've got a, 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 uh, a strong math background, maybe this is all you need. But really, no one's thinking about this when you're actually writing unit tests. When you are committing an act of unit testing and you're thinking about your code and this and that, you're not going to be thinking about this. And so we need a more intuitive, gut feel, emotional understanding of accuracy and precision that you can take away and apply to your work tomorrow. And it turns out there's a very good place to get that. So let us return to our uh, uh, space marines. Uh, this is a little ways into the movie. Um, some horrible things have already happened that we're not going to talk about, but uh, we are down, they're on the planet, they're in the alien hive, and this is the moment where things start to go very, very wrong for them. So uh, here's the next clip. Pay attention to Private Hudson. He's the guy with the motion tracker giving everybody the bad news. Uh, can't lock in. Talk to me, Hudson. Uh, multiple signals. They're closing. Go to infrared, people. I'm shocked. What's happening, eh, Paul? Can't see anything in here. Oh, your team out, Gorman. I got signals. I got readings. It's not in behind. Where, man? Right. Yeah, there's something moving and it ain't us. He is so right. Uh, that's the great actor Bill Paxton in his first big role. So now what you don't know if you haven't seen this movie, but those motion trackers are absolutely accurate in the sense of if there's something moving, they start beeping and they give you data. And if there's nothing moving, they don't. There's no false positives and no false negatives from those trackers anywhere in the movie. They're 100% accurate. 
So they're great tools. But you can see that there's a very worrying lack of precision. Nobody knows what to do with the information they're getting. The thing saying that they're moving all over, and they are, but no one knows where to look or what to do about it. So there's a very worrying lack of useful information. Now, on the other hand, uh, you heard Sergeant Apone say something about going to infrared and everyone flips down some little thing on their helmets. Now, they didn't have convenient infrared cameras back when Cameron was making this movie. Um, so we never really see what they would have seen through their infrared cameras, but we've got really good infrared cameras now. Uh, and we know exactly what it would look like. So this is a nice shot. This is from 2008. This is the first time the Mythbusters got their hands on some infrared cameras. I don't know if you had Mythbusters uh, in Europe. If not, that is a high point of Western civilization, and you should go find them because it's fantastic stuff. But uh, if you wanted a tool to go find famed Mythbuster James Heineman, well, he's right there. Uh, and we can very clearly see where he is. And, of course, you get a lot of information, right? You can see that the beret and the glasses and the infamous walrus mustache are cooler than his face. And you can actually see, if you note those two little yellow spots in his nostrils, he's breathing out through his nose in this frame. Two frames before this, those little yellow dots weren't there because he was inhaling. You can see him breathe. This is a real IR camera that's now, what, 15 years old or something. So we know that this is a very highly accurate and precise instrument. Now let's go back to our colonial marines and see how well their infrared cameras do. And now pay attention to uh, Corporal Dietrich, who is up on point in front of everybody else. Maybe they don't show up on infrared at all. Yeah, maybe they don't show up on infrared at all. They don't. She was just looking at one, and if you can see my cursor, I think that's working. And you may or may not know what these things look like, and if you don't, you may sleep better. Its head is here. Its shoulder is about there. This might be an elbow. And this right here is the tip of its tail. It's curled up in the wall, and she was just looking right at it. Her day does not improve after this. So what we see here from their forward-looking infrared cameras is that presumably they are high precision. Real infrared cameras are very precise. But you can see that in this case, it has a very distressingly low accuracy. It can't see the aliens because they're cold-blooded. This is biologically implausible, but that's not the biggest biological problem with these aliens. By the way, if you poke around enough online, you can f find places where very good uh, biochemists are talking about what these things would really be built out of. So what we can take away from this at a gut level when you're hunting bugs is that accuracy means, high accuracy means that when there's a bug, the alarm sound. When there's no bug, the alarms aren't sounding. No false alarms, no false negatives. Precision means that when the alarm goes off, you know where to look, you know what you're looking at, and you know precisely how worried you should be about what you see. So, uh, question so far, good Lord, I'm looking over here. Um, okay, uh, question from Roy Barkan or something. By the way, I'm a typical American in that I can speak no European languages. Um, I can speak math and quantum mechanics and C++. That's all my brain can handle. Yeah, that one. Uh, do you think we should strive to build our test such that most bugs will cause a single test to fail? Um, no, very much so, and we'll get there in about 40 minutes if I hurry. <laughs> that's, that's, that's actually a very important part. We'll get there. All right, let's go on. So uh, let's get into accurate. We'll tackle accuracy first. We'll get to precision later. Uh, accuracy is really in three parts, and the first part is really a simple point about don't leave any place for the bugs to hide. Um, we know that we can only write a finite number of unit tests. Unit tests take time to write. They take time and resources and money to maintain. 
They take time to build. They take time to run. And we know that we need to build and run them quickly because they're part of this fast development loop that we're all striving for. And we know that we've got a vast number of inputs. And we know that we can't write unit tests for every possible input to our function or our code. So what do we do? So this book here is uh, its still actually the best book I've come across, I think. Um, Glenford J. Myers uh, wrote this book. You might guess from the cover art that this is a little dated. This was published in 1979, I believe. And uh, but it's a great book. You have to you have to look past the fact that it's a little dated. He's talking about testing whole programs, where a whole program is read a bunch of numbers from a stack of punch cards and sort them. Right? We have bigger programs these days. Um, but if you sort of look past that aspect of this, it, it's still a great book. And he spends a great deal of time talking about and discussing precisely this issue. Um, and his uh, conclusion is that the best we can do is to maximize, well, in our terms, maximize the accuracy of our tests by maximizing the chances of finding a bug per test case. In other words, we can't test everything. But if we can carefully select our test cases, we can stack the deck in our favor. So uh, there's kind of three, point, three, three stages to this. And the first is called equivalence partitioning. Um, an equivalence class is a set of inputs that all produce the same test result. And that any value from an equivalence class will exercise the same path through your code which means that in principle, if you have an equivalence class with a bunch of values in it, testing any of them will serve for testing all of those values because they're all going to give you the same result, pass, fail, whatever. So if we can identify equivalence classes, we just select one value from each class and those are the test cases we need. Equivalence partitioning is the act of identifying equivalence classes. And we're gonna do an exercise in a minute uh, disclaimer, I'm abusing this terminology a little bit. I'm being very sloppy because it's faster and we don't have time to go into the details. I expect now that my talk is up on YouTube, uh, I expect people to complain about this. So let's take a really simple example. Let's take the absolute value of an integer. Um, this is the simplest example I could come up with. So we have uh, two paths through the code. Either the input value is less than zero, in which case we return as negative. Otherwise, we just return the value. So the domain is all the possible inputs. Now, the input is just an integer, so the domain is all possible integers from int min to int max inclusive. In real code, you would spell those standard numeric limits of something. Uh, but for now, that doesn't fit on a slide very well, so we'll go with this. Now, our output is also an integer, so in principle, the codomain is, again, all integers, but we really know that we should only be getting values out in the range from 0 to int max inclusive. So that's the range of the function. Now, based on looking at the function, there's two paths through the function. So there's probably two equivalence classes. So the first one, let's call that equivalence class 1, is... And the set of all inputs for which that conditional is false. And we take the second path through and we just return the value you sent in. So that's equivalence class one uh, from zero to int max inclusive. And equivalence class two is everything else from int min to zero, not including zero. These are all the values for which that conditional is true. And we take the first path. So that ought to be fairly straightforward so far. And again, in principle, testing one value, any value from each should and does exercise all pass through the function. So we can completely test this function, at least up to this point, with two test cases, one where we send in a value from equivalence class one, one where we send in a value from equivalence class two, and we're good. Now, we're not really done yet. That's just the first stage. Step two is that you then go and look very closely at the boundary conditions particularly for equivalence classes that define a range, which is what this example does, what you want to do is look at the boundaries and see if you need additional test cases to cover 
edge cases, literally, right? And this is important because those boundaries are where behavior changes, where mistakes are easy to make, like maybe you type less than versus less than or equal to or something. You might want to check values near those boundaries. If those boundaries are places where behavior changes, maybe values near those boundaries are where things are starting to get a little interesting or a little strange or something. So you, you might consider testing values near the boundaries or the edges of your equivalence classes. So for example, uh, we've got these two equivalence classes. Let's look at the boundaries. So equivalence class one goes from zero to int max. We'll work our way down. Um, so we might examine the code and say, now does int max do anything troubling? And the answer is no, the conditional is false. You go to the second uh, code path, it returns int max, you're fine. Nothing interesting, doesn't need to be a separate test case. Look at the other edge of equivalence class one, zero. Uh, does that do anything interesting? The answer is no, it still makes the conditional false. You take the second path, you're fine. Um, what about near these edges, like plus or minus one? Does anything interesting happen? And the answer is again, no. Plus one still falls into equivalence class one. It makes the conditional false. Nothing is interesting. Minus one, no, it's uh, a negative value. The conditional is true. You take the first path. Nothing is interesting there. But then you go look at the other boundary of equivalence class two, and you realize that you have a problem. Because uh, this is how you spell those correctly. Standard numeric limits of int double colon min is negative 2,147,483,648. But standard numeric limits int max is positive 2,147,483,647, right? Signed integers do not have a symmetric range around zero. There's one more negative value than there is positive. And so if I pass int min into that function, I'm going to invoke undefined behavior because trying to take the negative of that value is signed integer overflow. That is defined to be undefined behavior by the language standard. So what do we do? Well, we change our second equivalence class, equivalence class two is now negative integers not including int min. So we're from int min to zero, not including either endpoint. And then we've got some third case, which we don't quite know what to do with yet, which is int min, what do we do with it? Now, as written, this has a narrow contract. If you pass int min, you're invoking undefined behavior and you're out of luck. There's no point in writing a unit test for that because there's no defined correct answer that the language is going to give us. So the answer here is don't test out of contract input. Now, the question is, well, what do we do from a unit testing point of view in this case? The answer is you cannot test this function for handling int min because it doesn't. What you have to do is now go test every other place in your code that calls this to make sure that it that that the call sites aren't val or aren't invalidating the contract that they're not calling with an invalid value. So this is the problem with narrow contracts is that it's always on the call site to call correctly. And so you have to put your tests there. Of course, the advantage of narrow contracts is that your code's fast. If, for example, we were to rewrite this as a wide contract, where we look for the bad value and we throw an exception, or we do something with defined behavior, well, our function is now two, three, four times slower than it would have otherwise been. But now we can test this here. Now calling abs, uh, calling abs with int min is defined behavior, it's now a runtime error because we can throw an exception. So now we have a third equivalence class consisting of uh, int min, and we can test that. So now what we have is equivalence class one from zero to int max that takes one path through the code. We have equivalence class two int min to zero, not counting int min, which takes another path through the code. And we have a third case, which is our error case. And that takes the third path through the code where we throw the exception. Now that looks pretty good. This looks like we're being pretty complete. There's really one more step that we should do. And that is we should look for interesting conditions. Interesting values are derived just from studying the algorithm and looking at the code. And that means that interesting 
values are the values that are declared interesting by you. You wrote the code, or you're the one dealing with it. You're the world-class expert on the code. You know what's interesting and what isn't. Add tests for interesting code. Unless those tests are very expensive to write and expensive to maintain, you might question it. But for example, in this case, zero is probably an interesting value. From a strictly mathematical point of view, zero is very interesting for the absolute value function. It's the point where the derivative is undefined, where things change. That ought to be an interesting value. Make that an equivalence class on its own if you want to. But you can also consider that interesting is in the eye of the beholder. Consider that unit tests aren't tested by other unit tests, right? That leads to a stack overflow or something, uh, infinite regress. The only way we ever prove our unit tests correct is by inspection. Someone has to go read them, which means that the person reading it might have some opinions about what's likely to be interesting. So you might consider adding as interesting cases, as separate equivalence classes, values that look important to future readers, because this will reassure them that you have handled those interesting cases. It makes it easier for someone reading your unit tests to declare them true or correct by inspection to know that you've covered all the bases. So add cases for interesting values. So in this case, we might pull zero out of equivalence class one and make it its own on the basis that it's a boundary value or it's interesting. And here are the four equivalence classes for our function. So if you fire in one value from each of these, you end up with four test cases, one for positive values above zero to int max, one with the value zero, one with a negative integer that isn't int min, and then int min is your error condition. And you've covered everything. Now, this brings up an interesting point. Um, in, in other talks, in practically anything you read about unit testing, in general, you'll come across the ideas of white box and black box testing. And usually these are used in the context of trying to test a class, some object-oriented thing. But it really applies to functions as well. Um, black box testing means that you test only the observable behavior of your code, which for a class means that you're only allowed in your unit tests to call the public member functions. White box testing means that you have usually by some nefarious means gotten inside the class you're testing and your unit tests are examining the internal state of the thing. Are all the gears and switches and levers and booleans doing what they're supposed to do? That's white box testing. Usually white box testing is um, not recommended uh, for a lot of reasons, but mainly maintainability. If your unit tests know about and depend on the internal implementation details of your code, and you refactor your code, which by definition shouldn't change the behavior, you have to go change the code in your unit tests to match. And that can be philosophically unpleasant because how do you know that you changed your unit tests correctly to match your new code? It can also be prohibitively expensive. If, for example, you're working in the automotive industry or in aerospace, and you have to prove that your unit tests cover every line of code and every branch and every function, if you have to go change your unit tests, those can be very expensive validation routines that you have to run to prove that your unit tests are still good. So the question here is, should we derive our, accept, uh, our equivalence classes from a detailed knowledge of the innards of the code? Should we derive our equivalence classes by doing the equivalent of white box testing and looking at the code to find out whether we're covering all the, error, or all the uh, code paths? Now, if the answer to this question is yes, which is what we just did. We were looking at the code to decide what the equivalence classes were. That means that our equivalence class definitions, and therefore the way we've written our unit tests, are coupled to the implementation details. Our definition of the equivalence classes might depend on the implementation. Like our original idea about equivalence class one is that it included zero, and that equivalence class two did not include zero, and we based that on the fact that in our code it said is x less than zero. Maybe that's okay. But if the answer to this question is no, 
Well, okay, if so, if the answer is yes, that's fine, but that means that, again, our unit tests based on our equivalence classes may be coupled to the code. If the answer to this question is no, then our equivalence class definitions, and therefore the way we've written our unit tests, is decoupled from the implementation, which is a good thing, but maybe we've also missed really important corner cases. We, maybe there's test cases we need to write that we've missed. Now, I don't have an answer to this. I have talked myself into one way or the other. Heck, I can do that weekly, okay? I don't know what the answer is, but this is a question you should consider. Now, in this case, in our the example we just worked through, it's simple enough that honestly, we can actually do it either way and we'll be okay. So for example, this is how you would do a black box equivalence class analysis of what we were talking about. What you do now is you look at the observable behavior, which is what comes out of the function, which is just the range, and you look at what gives you values or chunks of that range on input, and those are your equivalence classes. So we have interesting cases here, zero, obviously, it max is interesting. It's, you know, those are the edge cases. And then you've got all the stuff in between. So if you were to do an equivalence class deconstruction on this, well, this is an obvious equivalence class. The only value that gives you zero on output is zero on input. There you go, equivalence class. Now, there's two ways to get all this stuff in the middle. So equivalence class two is all the positive integers that give you all that stuff in the, in the middle. Zero to int max not including the edges. And you got an equivalence class for all the negative values that map to those positive values. So that's negative int max to zero. Note negative int max, not int min. We'll get there in a minute. Now let's look at int max on output. There's two ways to get that. There's one of them. Send int max in, get int max out. Now from looking at the code, you might say, yeah, well, that's part of the equivalence class right below it, the light blue stuff. Maybe you don't know that from a black box. That's fine. It's a separate equivalence class. And then you look at, well, it's negative int max that gives me that. OK, fine. And this is the point at which you realize, ah, negative int max is an int min, and that's my error condition. So in this simple case, you can do a black box analysis just on the output and knowing some things about how C++ works. And you can get basically the same answer. That's fine. But this is a simple case. The best advice I can give you right now is that if you have time, do a black box analysis, come up with your equivalence classes, which are nice and decoupled from your code, then go back and do the white box version and see what you missed. That might take longer than you've got, in which case you just go straight to white box. I'm inclined to think that unit testing is already hard enough as it is. We should look at the code and come up with all the error cases we can. But again, that's tentative, right? You can make a strong case for the other way. Um, let's finish up equivalence classes. Two more points. Operations on sequences. This is clearly a more uh, complicated uh, situation. Anytime one of your input values denotes uh, how much work to do, like the number of elements, maybe explicitly, or here it's implicit in how many elements are in your range, you're immediately going to have three equivalence classes right off the bat. Zero, which is there's no work to do. And we know uh, that that's a really easy case to miss when you're writing your code. Bad things can happen. Um, there's one element and many. So these are your three equivalence classes, maybe. You might want to check two. For example, you do a white box analysis and you go look at the sort algorithm. And it's one of these that chooses a pivot point or uh, you have to choose a location in the range and you're going to partition around that. Well, two is interesting because that forces the pivot point to be on one edge or the other edge of your range. Maybe that's an interesting case. But you do that first, and then you can look at the equivalence classes for what the range contains. Like you would start with you know, a set of random integers. Um, what happens if they're all the same? What if they're already sorted? What if they're in reverse order and whatnot? You can do the rest of your analysis. And finally, I just want to mention what happens if you've got multiple input parameters. This example started with aliens and types of machine guns and ammunition and things that got pretty gruesome. Uh, so uh, I came up with something totally ridiculous. We're dealing with camels and feed motorcycles. Why not? It's a, it's a silly example. What you do is you go, as best you can, do a, an equivalence class analysis of each parameter individually. So you come up with some set of uh, equivalence classes for camels, 
Maybe you've got one humped camels and two humped camels, and those are your equivalence classes. Maybe you've got expensive feed and cheap feed. Maybe you've got the fast motorcycles and the slow motorcycles, whatever. So in principle, you might think that your test suite needs to be some sort of uh, direct product or combinatorial explosion of these. But it turns out you really don't have to do all those either. For a success case, where you're actually running all the way through and everything works, any test that does a success case for a given equivalence class for one of these is good enough. If I've got two non-error equivalence classes for camels, I only need two tests. And if those tests exercise those, then I'm good. This is making a simplifying assumption that these don't interfere with each other, that there's not a code path that you need a two-humped camel and cheap feed, which is more likely to be the case. But the point is you don't have to do all of these combinations. You really only need to hit each equivalence class once and then look for places where these interfere and you need a particular combination of inputs. But I will point out that error cases should always be separate cases and should be their own test case. You don't want to hit an error condition and then go and see if you hit another error condition, for example. You always want error conditions to be separate. So to wrap up equivalence partitioning, ooh, I'm running a little late. I'll speed up. Um, if you look around online, you'll see that there's a lot of ire and anger about these. Um, now, honestly, a lot of the debate is more about language and definitions about what other people have used. And I'm setting myself up for that because I'm using these terms rather sloppily. But, um, well, there's a lot of unhappy people on the internet. We know that anyway. But I think a lot of this is that people are disappointed or were disappointed at some point in the past because this technique didn't live up to expectations. I think people originally thought that this would be some nice, deterministic, boring, grungy process that you could go through and do your analysis and it would spit out all the test cases you need and then we'd all be done. And we know that that doesn't happen, right? Real code is more complicated. My take on this is that it is an excellent tool for identifying possible test cases. It doesn't give you any answers. It doesn't tell you what an equivalence class is or whether this should be in this equivalence class or that, but it's a, a really good tool for making sure that you ask all the right questions. And you have to come up with the answers on your own, but at least you're asking the right questions. Okay, let's stop really quickly. Uh, I know I'm running late, but we'll see if we can make it up here. Slide 35, isn't that the point of TDD to avoid the white box test? Yes. So yes, white box testing can get around that. Um, in real life, in real life, when you're really writing code, yeah. And one of the nice things about test-driven development is that you never need white box testing because you've exposed everything you need to expose at some point in, in your design. Um, that is absolutely true. Um, I mentioned that a little bit in that earlier talk. My point here was that if you're looking at the code to come up with your equivalence classes, you're kind of doing white box testing, and maybe we don't want to do that, or maybe we do. Again, that's a little, again, it's a, it's a debatable point. All right, let's talk about correctness. I'll speed up a little bit. Um, this is a fairly obvious quality of unit tests. We need to correctly identify correct output as correct, incorrect output as being incorrect, and error handling as correctly handling the error. Um, interestingly, this is also a part of maintainability, which is not really what we're talking about today, but we'll see how this gets involved. Um, these are the typical examples of just brittle unit tests. And so, for example, any test that's testing your logging, and logging output typically has file and line numbers in it, if you reformat the source code, this unit test breaks. Now, that's a maintenance problem because you have to go fix it, but this is also a, an accuracy problem. You have gotten a false positive. That's an inaccurate test. Or again, Google, people from Google are always very, very concerned about hash tables and hash maps. You think maybe they use those a lot. Of someone writing a unit test and expecting the results of a hash to come out in a certain order, which we know they don't. Breaks on change. I want to look a little bit more closely <clears throat> at a specific case of this, though. Say that we're doing some complicated mathematical computation. This number pi we've heard is a good idea. So we're going to write this code to compute pi from scratch. And uh, it, since we're turning a float, um, as usual, we get about seven-ish significant figures that are correct, and all the rest is garbage. I've highlighted those in yellow. Now, if you write your unit test based on this output and you put in some of those garbage values, those or rather those garbage digits that really don't mean anything, 
and you build that into your unit test, now someone goes and improves the computation by returning a double, which by the way, all those digits are correct. Those are the ones in green. Your unit test now fails with this error because you had a slightly incorrect value baked into your unit test before and your errors were too small. So you get a fragile test, but you also get a false positive. This is inaccurate. Over-specifying correct leads to false positives. But going the other way doesn't help. If I'm only going to check to two or three significant figures and someone goes and writes a totally horrible way of computing pi, like this is, this passes. But this is a terrible way of computing pi. So under-specifying under -specifying correct lets bugs through, and that's also bad. So your definition of correct in your unit test should contain only as much information as you actually produce or that you actually need, but no less than that. For example, if you're computing pi because you have to figure out how much concrete is going to go into a uh, landscaping part of your backyard, how many decimal places do you really need, right? Seven is fine. And then the third part is validity, the third part of accuracy. And this really comes down to issues of circular logic. So, for example, um, we want to know what value we should compare our compute pi against. We're computing pi by taking the arc cosine of negative 1. So to come up with the value in our unit test, let's find a value by taking the arc cosine of minus 1. I love Dave Farley's take on this. Congratulations, you have just proven that the code we wrote is the code we wrote. This is circular logic. The accuracy of this test isn't defined because it can't ever fail. But don't laugh. Science does this all the time. Uh, ooh, very quickly. Um, there's, uh, this, this has been known for a long time. It's called the Hawthorne effect. This was the result of an ergonomic uh, experiment done in a big factory outside of Chicago back in, I think, the 1920s. They wanted to know if increasing or decreasing the amount of light in the factory would uh, increase worker productivity. So they measured worker productivity, increased the lights, and the workers got more productive. But then they went and decreased the lights and found that the workers also got more productive. It turns out that as soon as the lights changed, the workers knew they were being examined and worked harder so they didn't get in trouble, right? So it's, a, it's an experiment that by definition can never tell you anything useful. So this actually happens in science all the time. Um, but you do have to watch out for this. But I want to contrast that with what's a very good idea, which is where you go get your correct answer and some floating point limits on how correct it is from a trusted subject matter expert or from a prototype, something that you trust. In fact, if you're moving from a prototype, we do a lot of prototyping in MATLAB or sometimes Python. When we move that to C++, this is precisely the first set of unit tests we write. Go take the numbers that have convinced us that the algorithm works and bake those into your unit test. This is a great idea. Just make sure that you're careful about your floating point accuracy because your prototype is almost certainly doing a different set of floating point computations than your C++ is. So you have to be careful of that. Contrast that with doing almost, but not quite the same thing, where the number that we bake into our unit test, we got from running this code yesterday. <clears throat> People do this all the time. And so the point here is that we actually haven't shown that the code is correct. All we've shown is that it hasn't changed since yesterday. That's useful. There is a value in this. It's just not a unit test. It doesn't prove your code is, is correct, but it does show that it hasn't changed. And in many cases, that is extremely useful. That's an acceptance test. People do this when, for example, you've inherited some code and you don't actually know what the right answer is but you have some reason to think that it's right because it's been in production for five years and it works. Um, go see Claire McRae's uh, material. She's sort of the reigning queen of acceptance testing at the moment. Um, she's got a lot of great material on her site. She's given a bunch of CPPCon uh, and, and other uh, conference talks on the subject, but it's not a unit test. All right, so let's wrap up accuracy. Um, the result of the test matches the reality of the code. You need to test completely, which is equivalence partitioning, test correctly, which is use no more information than you have, but no less than you need, and make sure that you don't write circular logic and invalid tests that can't be falsified. OK, let me push on. We are running late. And let's get back to precision. Um, there's less to say about precision, so this, this doesn't go on for as long. 
Um, but there's an important point here. Remember that we had to be a little fuzzy about our definition of precision. Um, but we decided by analogy that that was something about how much useful information you got out of your experimental lab equipment. And as a very crude but instinctive heuristic, in your unit tests, precision can be measured by how fast you can go from finding out there's a problem to knowing where to go look and what to do about it. Now, to drive the point home, let's go back to our colonial Marines. This is towards the end of the movie. You'll note that the number of people involved has significantly reduced. They've taken a lot of casualties. And this is a very, very tense part of the movie because this is going to be the last stand. The aliens are coming, and this is going to be the big final battle. Here we go. Remember, those are always accurate. Yeah. Spoiler alert, the room they're in has a drop ceiling. The aliens, they're looking this way. The aliens are up there. <laughs> famous, famous quote. And so again, we see that these are high accuracy. There really are bugs there. And interestingly, the range is highly accurate. They really are four meters away. It's just worryingly low precision in which direction. They're up there, not over there. And you can see that they figured it out, but boy, those four or five seconds could have been better spent. So the first rule of precision is that we need clarity in our unit test results. We, If something goes wrong, we need to know exactly where to look and what to do about it. So the first rule is to use a good unit test framework. Now, uh, at CPPCon uh, 2022, um, uh, Amir Kirsch, gave a nice talk, back to basics talk on unit tests. And he actually went into this in some detail. That's a good talk to go watch. Um, what we want out of a good unit test is that a passing test generates little or no output. A failing test gives you a lot of information like what test suite failed, what test case failed, what assertion failed, the expected values, the, abs the, the actual values you got, file and line numbers, right? You need all of this out of your unit test framework except nothing less. This, by the way, is why you don't go roll your own unit tests, unless you're people like Phil Nash, who is the one who run, went out and wrote uh, Catch 2. Um, good unit test frameworks spend a lot of time arranging for the output to be very clear. Go use a unit test framework that, has a, that, that does a good job of this, and spend some time learning how to get it to give you good results. Now, the second part, this gets back to that question we had earlier, organization. This is an example I stole from Kate Gregory's great talk on emotional code. Highly recommended. I make everyone on my team go watch that talk. Um, we have a test case here. We're declaring a standard vector of aliens. And then right after that, we make sure that the vector's default constructor works. Should that be there? The question is, does line five make any sense? And you can ask yourself questions like, what are the chances that that fails? Standard library implementations have bugs. Probably not this one. Um, 
But if that does fail, what should you do about it? And the answer is probably write a DR against your standard library. But consider what would you do if that line failed, but all the rest of your code worked, which is probably impossible. OK, that's silly. You, you wouldn't write that. But what if that isn't standard vector? What if that is some custom container written by that other group at your company? Of course, you're all coming to the Munich C++ write-up. So you all write unit tests for your code. But those clowns down the hallway that write the tests that you depend on, and they don't always test stuff, most big companies have got a team like that, right? It's not your responsibility to test their code, but it might be reasonable for you to do so if they don't do a good job. In this case, this might be reasonable. But the point is that you don't do it here. You don't test their code in your test suite, because if that fails, your test suite is the one that fails. Everybody's going to be looking at your code and not where the problem is. Avoid red herrings. So I like to, if you need to do stuff like that, it's rare, but sometimes you do. Most big projects have got a directory someplace where you've got stuff like the header files that handle the portability. If I'm on Windows, I'm going to include this header. If I'm on Linux, I'll include that one. I like to stick stuff like this over in that area because it's a weird place for a unit test, and you really don't expect those unit tests to fail. So if one does, it gets a lot of attention. right? You, but the point is you pull it out into a separate unit test so that if this fails, it's pointing directly to the code involved. Now, if it's the case that only that fails, which is probably unlikely, but I suppose it's possible, then you're set in the sense of everyone knows exactly where the bug is. Oh, it's their code. You know where to go look. It's much more likely their code fails and your tests fail because you use their thing. But at least some of the output is pointing the right direction. Or so organizing your test cases is important because you want to point as clearly as possible at where the problem is. And that pointer starts with what test we just failed. Now, this brings up an interesting point. There are two competing schools of test-driven development. I don't know a whole lot about this, honestly. There's the Detroit School and the London School. And you can go look at these blog posts um, if you'd like to know more about that. But the Detroit School, or Classicist School, which is what we've been doing, typically doesn't make a lot of use of mocks or test doubles. So this is what we just saw up on the top, where in our unit test, we're using their custom vector to implement our unit tests. And if their thing fails, our unit test will fail. And this is what we were just talking about. The classicist or Detroit school would say, we don't need line five for the reasons we just talked about. It's great, but put it somewhere else. That should be tested elsewhere. If you have to do it yourself, fine. Test it elsewhere. On the other hand, the mockist school or the London school mocks everything. Any given unit test doesn't use anything from anywhere else. It depends only on the code that you're working on. This is hard to do in C++ because mocking is hard to do in C++. C++ 20, I don't know, whenever we get uh, uh, compile time introspection, this will get better. But anyway, what the mockist school would do is they would not use that custom thing by the people down the hall. They would mock up a custom vector for purposes of this unit test. They would also say we don't need line five, but they'd say we don't need it at all because we're mocking it ourselves. The point here is that this, interestingly, is a slider that lets you trade accuracy and precision, which is not obvious at first glance. So if your class or test uses something from elsewhere, right, their thing, and their thing fails, its tests will fail, presumably. But your tests will also fail, which means that you get two signals, one pointing at their stuff, one pointing at your stuff. That really is less precision. If you mock their thing and your test fails, nothing else fails, well, it's your code. This is a more precise answer. It pre points precisely at your code. Put it another way, by using mocks in your tests, you're limiting the blast radius of their failures. Their mistake doesn't make your stuff fail. So London or Mockus tests uh, are more precise because you get fewer red herrings, less extraneous signals, more direct knowledge about exactly where you should go look. But on the other hand, this reduces your accuracy. If your class or your test uses, uh, if, or if, if the, your real code rather uses a thing, and your tests use that thing, you're testing against the real thing. 
Whereas if you're using a mock in your tests, you're testing against a mock thing. And every difference in behavior between the real thing and the mock you're using is exactly like the difference between the real ceiling and that drop ceiling that the aliens were coming in through. Don't let them come in through the ceiling. So this is a trade-off. Again, there's no right answer. It's a question of what decisions you want to make when you do this. But I will point out that you need to test your mocks and you need to test them separately. If you're going to say that your code works because some tests using mocks work, and you're also going to say that your mocks are correct because they work with your code, you have just done a circular logic loop, right? Um, you're saying that your mocks work because your your code is correct, and your code is correct because your mocks work, right? Don't do that. Okay, now there's one more point about precision, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, let's go back to the very end of that clip, and I want you to pay attention to the dialogue when they realize that something's wrong. Here we go. Six. Actually, that's inside the room. That's where you want, man. Look, you're not reading it right. <laughs> Yeah. Humans are not good at handling contradictory sensory input. They're confused because their trusty thing tells them that there's an alien right over there. But they're looking and there's nothing there. Contradictory information is very, very confusing. And we know that humans don't do a good job of this. Now, if this happens to you, for example, you got a unit test failing, saying your code's wrong, but you're looking at the code and it's clearly right. And both of these cannot be correct in the same universe. Your unit tests are contradicting themselves or they're contradicting what you're seeing in the code. That can be very confusing. Now, if it's nine in the morning, you're just getting into the office, you're finishing up your latte, this is fine, right? We actually do this all the time. We deal with, hey, that shouldn't go right, and we go fix it. But the point is that humans get much, much worse at handling contradictory sensory input when we are tired or angry or frightened, which is precisely the situation that our protagonists are in here. And, but you can see them, even though they are very tired and very angry and very frightened, you can see them working through it. One person gets a reading, it doesn't make sense, Someone else says, check your readings, go do it again. He checks, no, 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 this is really what it's saying. Then a third party gets a separate instrument and double checks it. This is exactly, this is good science. But boy, they could have been spending that time doing something better like shooting at them. The point is that your unit test should not do this to people. Don't confuse the tired, angry, frightened humans. Okay. At nine in the morning, this is fine, but consider what happens if you got a unit test failure or confusing failure at two in the morning the night before an important release. And management is bringing that breathing down your neck because it's your unit test case failing, although it's their fault, right? This is not good. Even worse, what if you're doing this at two in the morning after a release and the next day your vice president has got to fly across the company and apologize to your biggest customer? That hasn't happened to me, but I sat next to a team that went through that, and boy, I was glad I wasn't on their team. Don't confuse the tired, frightened, angry humans, all right? You need high-precision tests so that when something happens and things are confusing and you're tired, you can still quickly get clear answers to your questions and handle the problem. So let's summarize this. Good tests are accurate and precise. Accuracy means that the test results match reality, Okay, maybe they don't show up on infrared at all as a bad situation. Don't go there. Precision kind of means that the unit tests are, results are useful, right? Bad con precision is confusing. That can't be that's inside the room is not a good position to be in. So as you go write your unit tests, armor up, okay? Take, uh, take the time to make sure that your tests are accurate and precise because you're going to need that armor. Because there are some big bugs out there, and we need all the help we can get. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, we went 
All right, 10 minutes over. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, we can stick around for as long as you guys want to ask questions. And I don't know if we do that here or in that chat, but I'll leave that up to, uh, to the moderators. So yeah, first of all, thank you for this wonderful talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, if there are some one or two questions in the, in the in the chat now, we will go through them now. And if the if you have questions um, that you feel are more suited for a conversation or a discussion, we will have the after talk chat. Um, that's a Zoom meeting, so you just need a I think you need a Zoom account and the client installed. Maybe it works in the web browser. I'm not sure. Um, and People are saying it's a, it was a great talk. So. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. it. This is a lot of fun. I mean, anytime you've got clips from aliens and anything, right? This was a big part of... I mean, out, out here in Colorado, me and all my friends were in high school when that movie came out, and that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. So, And that's the original movie, right? Uh, that's number two. Alien is the first one. Oh, where they're on the spaceship. Was like they already know these monsters exist. Yeah, this is, this is the second one where, where they go back up. And uh, the, the first one, the first one is harder to get clips out of that you can show at a CPP con. <laughs> it's arguably the best horror movie ever. Uh, people debate this. This one is half horror movie and half action or war movie. Mm -hmm. um, very intense movie. Again, if, if you haven't seen the movie, I recommend it, but just be aware that it's rated R or whatever the equivalent is in your country, and it's earned. You, you noticed in some of those last talks, there is a 10-year-old girl involved, and she is not put in like the children in Jurassic Park were put in just to appeal to families. She's there because every time a little 10-year-old girl is in jeopardy, everything becomes so much worse. And when she's in jeopardy, and then one of those damn motion trackers start beeping, and you know something's coming and no one knows where it is, right? That's, yeah. Watch that with a good friend you can hang on to, all right? That's that's my, <laughs> okay. Do you wanna, do you wanna jump over to the, to the chat? Yeah, let's uh, wrap up the stream. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Dave again for this great talk. My pleasure, let's do this again.